We begin tonight with late breaking news. San Antonio police are investigating a shooting on the city's east side. We are learning a man was shot in an apartment in the 4000 block of East South Cross. The night team Stephen Cavasso is there now. And Stephen, what do you know about that man's condition tonight? Uh, Tim Courtney, now we are learning some information right now. That man was rushed to the hospital with possible life threatening injuries. Now, San Antonio police are still here investigating that shooting, and they plan to be out here for some time as they piece together what took place here tonight. Now, information is still limited, but what we can confirm is that all of this happened sometime after eight. Now, that man was inside one of the apartments here when he was shot. Police say other people were also inside. Now, at this time, they are searching for two men as possible suspects. Witnesses described one wearing a black hoodie and another wearing red and black. Now, police again say that this information is still limited, but we will bring you the latest information as we get that those details. For now, reporting live on the east side, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Tim, Courtney. Thank you, Stephen. An update now to a story we first broke earlier tonight on KSAT.com. A child is dead after a wreck on a stretch of Highway 90 and West Military. The crash shut down both lanes of the highway for several hours. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with San Antonio police and has more on what witnesses told them. The back of this car you see here took the brunt of the impact. Sadly, that's where a seven-year-old girl was sitting. What was observed is that a later 2009 uh, Honda Accord was traveling eastbound on Highway 90 at a very high rate of speed. SAPD officer Alicia Pruneda says the car then lost control, sliding into oncoming lanes of Highway 90. Witnesses also explained that the car, as it crossed the median, it, while they didn't observe any uh, any rollovers that it was traveling backward, so reversing on the westbound lane. During that reverse, the car collided with a large taco truck. The driver of that taco truck told police that he couldn't avoid the collision. Police say the child in the back seat of the car was severely injured and she later died from those injuries. The 26 year old driver of the car and her passenger, a man in his 30s, were taken to the hospital. He is in serious condition and she is stable. Witnesses on scene told police they thought a blowout caused the car to lose control. Our traffic investigation will take those accounts into consideration in the investigation, but there's got to be a lot of cleanup. Bruneda says even though investigators haven't nailed down the cause of the fatal wreck, she encourages everyone to be extremely careful on the roadways, especially on Super Bowl Sunday. We have so many important things that we have to be grateful for. Taking the time to just call a driver or make arrangements is of the utmost importance. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. New on the night beat, San Antonio police are on the hunt for a suspect. They say shot a man several times this afternoon. It all happened over on the west side in the 200 block of Remolino about 430. Police say two men got into an argument before one of them pulled a gun and then the trigger. The victim was taken to University Hospital. That suspect still at large tonight. No other details have been made available. We'll bring you the latest as we get those new details in. Also new tonight, a person hit and killed by a truck while walking along Highway 281 has now been identified. Police say 23-year-old Alberto Flores was hit by a truck traveling south around 2.30 this morning. That truck also rear-ended another vehicle before hitting a guardrail. Police say the driver then jumped out of the truck and ran away. Officers are still looking for that person tonight. Flores was pronounced dead at the scene. Some arrests to tell you about tonight. Police say this man, Joshua Janchik, uh, led them on a foot chase after he refused to show his driver's license. The arrest affidavit says the officer were uh, trying to pull that suspect over on his motorcycle for a traffic violation and a broken signal. Police say he became aggressive when they tried to put handcuffs on him and he kicked a female officer in the face. The other officer also hurt his knee while chasing him. That suspect was eventually taken down and now faces an assault to a public servant charge. 22 year old Christopher Cruz has been charged with sexual assault of a child after allegedly pretending to be a 17 year old and starting a sexual relationship with a 14 year old. The affidavit reveals multiple incidents happening from the summer of 2018 until January of 2019. The victim says they had sex over 30 times and took nude photos mostly at his home. A young woman is badly injured and a deputy U.S. Marshal is in jail tonight following a head on collision. The woman who became pinned inside her car has been identified as 23 year old Taylor McCowan. San Antonio police arrested 40 year old Jonathan Jones after they say he was driving the wrong way on Loop 1604. McCowan's family tonight tells the night team Stephen Cavazos their loved one is fighting for her life. Now my child, she may not be here tomorrow. 
And if she is to get through this, she'll never be the same. Raquel Hatch speaking to KSAT last night, hours after learning her daughter, 23-year-old Taylor McCowan, was involved in a head-on collision. McCowan was a recent graduate from UTSA. Hatch saying her daughter had a bright future. In the blink of an eye, someone could take that from them. The crash happened early Friday morning on Loop 1604 near Babcock, a pickup truck crashing head-on into another vehicle, pinning that driver inside. San Antonio police say the truck was traveling the wrong way. Now the driver of that truck, Jonathan Jones, taken to this gas station where he was later arrested. He now faces a charge of intoxication assault, district clerk records later revealing he was a deputy U.S. Marshal. A spokesperson for the U.S. Marshals releasing a statement after the crash, saying Jones was relieved of his operational duties. Hatch unsure if he has any remorse. I'm not sure if it has any meaning or value or, or if he's even aware of what he's done to change the course of so many people's lives. Like her family, Taylor's twin sister Ashley left devastated. She feels as though she's lost a part of her and there's nothing I can do to fix that. Hatch says she's still holding on to hope for her daughter, but will never forget how their lives have been changed. I don't want this tragedy to be forgotten. Stephen Cavazos, Case at 12 News. The coronavirus now making an impact here in San Antonio. Lackland Air Force Base, now one of four quarantine zones in the country, screening military personnel and American contractors who are re-entering the U.S. from overseas. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper has approved a request for housing support for 1,000 people who may need to be quarantined after traveling to China where the coronavirus was present. Air Force officials say there will be a hotel-like facility on the base, which will serve as a shelter for up to 250 military personnel and contractors while they are screened. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg issued a statement this evening saying the Metro Health Department will also be monitoring the situation just as a precaution. His statement emphasized there are currently no people living in San Antonio who have been diagnosed with coronavirus. We will bring you the details about the latest case reported in the country coming up in a bit. Turning now to some of the day's other top stories, we now know the name of a man who San Antonio police say was fatally stabbed by his friend yesterday. He is identified as 44-year-old Albert Adame. Adame pronounced dead at the hospital after police say a disagreement happened between him and the suspect. Police got the call to the 400 block of Harlan Avenue. Adame was found with a major cut to his neck. They say the 31-year-old suspect used some sort of a sharp cutting object to cut Adame. That suspect still at large tonight. Heading now to a couple fires happening today across the city. On the north side, fire investigators say food left on a stove caused a fire at an apartment this afternoon. It happened in the 200 block of Hymer Road around 2 p.m. When firefighters got there, they saw heavy smoke coming from the apartment. No one was injured and firefighters were able to prevent the flames from spreading to other units. Over on the west side, another fire causing about $20,000 in damage to this home over on Woolley Drive. It happened about 11 a.m. Smoke could be seen billowing from that house as crews arrived. Three people were inside at the time. All were able to make it out, but one did suffer a burn to their leg. We're told she was taken to the hospital. What a gorgeous day outside today. We were able to get up into the 70s after a cold start. Just a beautiful start to the weekend, and tomorrow should be pretty nice as well. Let's take a look at the numbers for the day. The high today was 72 degrees. The low this morning, 39. You can expect a chilly morning tomorrow as well with temperatures just a little bit warmer than how they were across the entire state of Texas today. Pretty nice. Felt like spring outside, but believe it or not, we're going to get even warmer over the next few days. And on top of that, we've got an Arctic front on deck as well. I'll be back with a look at that busy forecast in just a few minutes. Courtney. Thank you so much, Sarah. The weather was beautiful today as thousands of spectators gathered this morning for the Western Heritage Parade in Cavill Drive downtown. Along with that event, hundreds also partook in our first KSAT Corral for the best seat in town to watch Longhorns, Wagons, and Texas Heritage Riders. Members of the Palomino Patrol led the annual parade. People at the event say it's the celebration of old Texas traditions that keep them coming back year after year. Oh, it's all about culture. It's all about our culture. So yeah, we'll definitely be out there checking it out as well. And to me, it's the culture and keep Texas alive, right? Got to represent Texas. Um, Dad has his own little ranch uh, and he's got animals out there with my sister. The San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo will begin next week on February 6th and last all the way through the 23rd. 
Still ahead on the night beat to acquit or convict. That's a decision senators must make following closing arguments this week in the impeachment of President Donald Trump. A look at what to expect. Plus, as the number of infections continues to grow well into the thousands, another case of the coronavirus has been confirmed in the United States. Details on that case and the person's condition ahead. And in politics tonight, the first actual voting of the 2020 presidential primary season is almost here. And the candidates uh, who left the campaign trail for the Senate impeachment trial are trying to make up for lost time. After the break, the latest from Iowa. Your voice, your vote. Several Democratic candidates uh, kept from the campaign trail because of the impeachment trial are now back at it, going full throttle today. They, along with their rivals, are making a crucial last case to voters in Iowa before the nation's first caucuses on Monday. Here's ABC's Marcy Gonzalez with more from Des Moines. Candidates crisscrossing Iowa. I need your help. I need you to commit to caucus. With just two days left before the nation's first vote of 2020. This moment will not come our way again. Senators running for president trying to make up for lost time, rushing back from Washington ahead of Monday's caucuses. We had planned to be running all over the state. I was in the U.S. Senate chambers involved in the impeachment trial of Trump. Fighting for us. Fighting for you. Senator Bernie Sanders like fighting Bernie. off criticism yeah, airing in Iowa in this Democratic Iowa. super PAC ad Senate campaign. I do have some concerns about Bernie Sanders' health, considering the fact that he did have a heart attack. And dismissing questions on his ability to unite the party, raised by Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who's also targeting the Democrats' other frontrunner, former Vice President Joe Biden. History has taught us that the greatest risk we could take going into a high-stakes election would be to fall back on the familiar. Mr. Biden on a 17-county bus tour through Iowa, touting his experience trying to win over undecided voters. There's going to be no time for on-the-job training. We need, we need a president on day one. And we were expecting to get the results of one last poll before the caucuses, but now they're not being released. The surprise decision coming after reports that Buttigieg's name was left off at least one of the survey calls, potentially compromising the findings. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Des Moines, Iowa. Sticking with politics here for a moment, KSAT News at 9 has you covered as far as all things 2020 elections are concerned. The Vote 2020 newsletter launched this week and will have a new edition every Tuesday this year. If you're not signed up already, you can still do that on our website. Just go to ksat.com slash newsletters. Lots of things to sign up for over there. Well, if you were at our uh, KSAT Corral or just the cattle drive in general, yep. it was so pretty outside. It was really chilly nice. this morning. Yeah. Though. People were bundled up. Yes. We got down into the 30s, but it did end up being... Shed a, the layers. Yeah, a beautiful day. <laughs> By there, the end guys. of the event, people were like, I came here all bundled up and now I'm taking off layers. <laughs> Took that scarf off quickly. And that's the way it's going to be tomorrow, okay. too. A lot of people yeah. will be enjoying some time outdoors, maybe grilling because of Super mm -hmm. Bowl Sunday. So expect really nice weather tomorrow. Uh, and more good news for you. Today's pollen counts look great. Mold and mountain cedar are both yeah. low. Yeah, woo woo. A mold is at 170. Mountain cedar is at 40. And I just want to remind you mountain cedar season is starting to come to an end. We usually see mountain cedar season peak right around uh, the middle of January. But as we round out uh, January and enter into February, we're going to come to the end of mountain cedar season here uh, soon. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that count can't go up a little bit from today. But just to let you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, though, once mountain cedar season ends, guess what begins? Oak season. So we've got a lot to cover in the pollen count over the next few months. Here's a look at the high temperatures across uh, the Alamo City and the KSAT 12 viewing area today. Pretty nice out there. 74 New Braunfels, 73 in Hondo. It was 76 out in Del Rio, 72 up in Kerrville. And uh, right now outside, it's pretty pleasant. You can see those planes flying in uh, from uh, into the airport there. Uh, 50 degrees outside right now. Temperatures have really cooled down pretty effectively. Uh, we're down by 22 degrees from the afternoon high temperature. And so you can bet that by tomorrow morning, it's going to be pretty chilly as well. Probably a morning low right near about 42. We've got some of those cirrus clouds out there right now, and we'll have cirrus clouds early tomorrow morning. The sunrise should be just absolutely beautiful. We'll already be near 70 degrees around the lunch hour, and then in the afternoon, topping off a few degrees warmer than today, we'll be near 75 in the afternoon. A southwest breeze at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Notice that clouds are really going to increase uh, in the second 
second part of the day. And by the start of Monday, we could have one or two isolated showers around. So we'll keep an eye on that as well. Take a look at our weather setup across the state of Texas. You can see those cirrus clouds moving in play, but generally high pressure system really maintaining its hold across the central plains. That's why we don't really see much precipitation. There are some snow showers and some uh, isolated showers over the Appalachian Mountains and generally across the US. No real cold core of air just yet, but look up toward Canada. Take a look at these temperatures in Canada and Alaska. It, Alaska, it is 34 below out in Barrow, Alaska. This is that cold core of Arctic air that's going to send our temperatures swinging early next week by the middle of the week. Now, that Arctic air is going to take its time spilling across the U.S. By Tuesday, we'll be in the middle of a warming trend. It'll be 80 degrees for the high on Tuesday, but then that Arctic air will already be working its way through Texas. By the start of Thursday, we could be dipping to near freezing. It's going to be cold too behind that front with windy conditions and a wind chill. I also have to mention the potential for a light wintry mix by Wednesday and Wednesday night. So we'll keep our eye on that. If we do get a light wintry mix, it would mainly be up in the hill country and also little to no accumulation on the roads because the ground will be a little too warm. But of course, evolving forecast, Courtney, so we'll keep our eye on that. I would say it's surprising to see both of those types of things in the forecast, but not here. Not here and not during rodeo time because, as you know, <laughs> weather gets wacky around rodeo time. Yeah, it's the time of the year. It does. All right, the guys are talking basketball. Speaking of rodeo, it's the time when we say goodbye to our Spurs for quite some time, but they gave a treat to the folks who showed up for their last home game before the rodeo road trip. Absolutely. They're leaving on a high note. They took care of business in the second half. When we come back, we'll show you how they did it and came back to beat the Hornets. Plus, don't call it a comeback. The Longhorns pulling off a wild one. Next. Spurs take the court at the AT&T Center for the last time in nearly a month prior to the start of the rodeo road trip, taking on the Charlotte Hornets tonight. Good start for the Silver and Black here. Kick out to Trey Lyles in the corner for three, and he knocks it down. 10-5 San Antonio. DeMar DeRozan starts to heat up, trying to draw contact, and he knocks the shot down anyway. Impressive stuff there. It's still a five-point game. And then a little later, Jakob Pertl drives the lane and throws it down with one hand. Spurs lead 30-28 to after one. Second quarter, they keep it going. Derek White pulls up. Drains the three ball. That makes it 33 to 30 Spurs, but the Hornets answer with a huge run. Cody Zeller hesitates and then rises for the slam over four Spurs defenders. Charlotte leads by as many as 17 points in the second quarter, but San Antonio closes strong. DeMar to Lyles for the jam. The Spurs still trail, though, 63-50 at halftime. Third quarter, Spurs on the comeback trail. Jakob comes up with the loose ball and shows off the Euro step for the lay-in. Nice move from the big man and the bench on their feet. They love it. That cuts the lead down to four. A little later, DeMar pulls up, knocks down the mid-range jumper. Spurs take their first lead of the second half, and they're up 79-74 heading into the fourth quarter. And that's when Patty Mills comes alive, knocking down the triple. Mills with three three balls in the first two and a half minutes of the second quarter, and San Antonio leads 90-77. And they're not done. DeJounte Murray lets it fly from the corner and gets it to rattle in. Spurs go up 101-85, and there's no letdown tonight. San Antonio gets the big win, 114-90. Yeah, he was great. You know, a lot of guys played well in the second half. I mean, they scored 27 in the second half. Uh, and they scored more in the first quarter than that, and they scored more than that in the second quarter. So it was a fine effort defensively, and we were aggressive offensively. So uh, we played a great second half, and a lot of people participated. Next up, Spurs start their rodeo road trip in the Staples Center Monday night against the Clippers. In college hoops, Texas looking for their second straight win this afternoon at home against Iowa State, and they need to rally. Second half down 63 to 58. Courtney Ramey calls his own number and drains a triple from the top of the arc. That makes it a two-point game. Next Texas possession, Kai Jones finds Jericho Sims under the basket for the flush. Longhorns down 65-63, and they finally break through. It's Ramey again, this time from the wing. Got it. Texas takes their first lead of the second half, 66-65, and they cap it off in style. Matt Coleman the third saves the ball out of bounds with a long pass ahead to Donovan Williams for the game ceiling slam, and Texas wins it, 72-68. Top-ranked Baylor back at home looking to improve to 19-1 today against TCU. Bears rolling early first half. Matthew Mayer finds Tristan Clark for the Tomahawk slam. Baylor goes up by five. And then final seconds of the half, it's Mayer getting an open look from the wing, and he's got it. 
Baylor leads 35-24 at halftime, and they keep it going in the second half. Davion Mitchell with a steal at half court, and he's going to lay this one in. Baylor tops the Horned Frogs 68-52. Closer to home, UTSA hosting Middle Tennessee. Javon Jackson averaging 26 points per game coming in. Roadrunners start strong in this one. Keaton Wallace lobs to Jacob Germany for the emphatic slam. UTSA goes up by two, and the crowd is loving it. Then from long distance, Jackson creates his own shot and knocks it down. Roadrunners go up 14 to 10. Blue Raiders responding kind. Eli Lawrence hits his own triple. That cuts the lead back down to one, but the Roadrunners respond again. Wallace to Germany again for another alley-oop. We're all tied at 18 points apiece, but Middle Tennessee goes on a late run. C.J. Jones gets the tough shot to fall here. And UTSA falls in a tight one, 83-80. to Next up for the Roadrunners, only four games left in the regular season. They'll be at Old Dominion on Thursday at 6 p.m. Coming up later in the show, area swimmers punch their tickets to the state meet. We've got all the highlights. Tim, Courtney, back to you see guys. The local pool sharks. We'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> you got it. We'll be right back. Now to the impeachment trial of President Donald Trump, the Senate voting to block new witnesses and documents from being introduced. The next step, closing arguments, which take place over two days before a final vote to acquit or convict the president. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has more on how this might all wrap up from Capitol Hill. Senators laying out the rules for the final phase of President Trump's impeachment no, trial. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. The uh, proceedings reaching a vote. turning point Friday after Republicans no secured enough votes to block a motion for new witnesses and documents. It's a grand tragedy, one of the worst tragedies that the Senate has ever overcome. Ahead of the vote, House managers pleaded with the upper chamber to hear from potential key witnesses, particularly former today? National Security Advisor John Bolton who positioned himself at the center of the debate after reportedly claiming in his unpublished book that President Trump told Bolton and other White House officials he withheld military aid from Ukraine for political purposes. John Bolton could corroborate the rest of our evidence and confirm the president's guilt. The problem is what it prove, prove, prove is not an impeachable offense. The 51-49 vote ultimately coming down to two Republican senators. Ms. Murkowski. Alaska's Lisa Murkowski and Tennessee's Lamar Alexander, who voted no on the motion to extend the trial. The two stating they had heard enough, thus ensuring President Trump's impeachment proceedings would be the first without witnesses in U.S. history. Senators have the weekend off, giving those four 2020 Democratic presidential candidates who've been off the trail for this impeachment trial a chance to campaign in Iowa before the caucuses. The trial will resume on Monday. Megan Tavrizian, ABC News, Capitol Hill. An eighth case of coronavirus has been confirmed in the U.S., the latest one in Boston. The Massachusetts State Department of Public Health confirming the positive test of a University of Massachusetts student in his 20s. Health officials say he had recently traveled to Wuhan, China, and got medical care soon after returning home to Boston. The patient was put into isolation and is said to be recovering and, quote, doing well. A city health official said the man's infection does not pose an increased risk to other university students. On Friday, U.S. health officials declared the coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency. There have been thousands of confirmed infections in more than 20 countries with more than 250 deaths. Nearly all of the cases are in China. Meanwhile, Delta is moving up its timeline for suspending flights between the U.S. and China. That's in response to the coronavirus outbreak. The airline will start suspending those flights beginning tomorrow. Delta had originally announced that the suspensions would begin on Thursday. That move follows a Department of Health and Human Services ban on U.S.-China travel, which is set for tomorrow. American and United have also begun cancellations. Delta expects its U.S.-China flights to remain suspended at least through April 30th. Taking a look at other headlines around America tonight, two people were killed when they were shot at the end of a funeral. Riviera Beach police say it happened at a church near Palm Beach. They estimate about 13 rounds were fired shortly after the funeral services ended. Those shots leaving a 15-year-old boy and a man dead. Another juvenile and a woman were injured. At last check, police were still searching for that shooter. 
Two people in Atlanta are dead after a crash on a busy freeway caused a massive fire. Take a look. Police say multiple vehicles and a tanker truck crashed this morning. They say the tanker began leaking and that liquid is what caused this fire on your screen. It then engulfed a vehicle and spread to the sewer system. Authorities had to completely stop traffic on that expressway. The best-selling author known as the Queen of Suspense has died. The publisher for Mary Higgins Clark confirming her death on Twitter. Simon & Schuster tweeted she passed away Friday night, surrounded by family and friends. Clark is known for dozens of novels sold worldwide, including best-selling suspense titles such as Loves Music, Loves to Dance, and A Stranger is Watching. Some of her books were turned into television films such as The Cradle Will Fall. Mary Higgins Clark was 92. Kobe Bryant's widow Vanessa Bryant says she wants to keep some of the memorabilia fans have used to honor her late husband who died in a helicopter crash last weekend along with her daughter Gianna and seven other people. Fans have been leaving t-shirts, letters, basketballs, stuffed animals and toys around the Los Angeles Staples Center. According to the Los Angeles Times, Staples Center President Lee Z Zeidman says that the items will be placed in containers and sent to the Bryant family. Tax season can often mean scam season, and we've got a new alert for you tonight. The Better Business Bureau is getting the word out with Tax Identity Theft Awareness Week. All a scammer needs is your Social Security number to steal your returns. The BBB is also aware of, uh, says to also be aware of IRS imposters. It says if someone calls you and demands money immediately, don't pay it. Tax Identity Theft Awareness Week runs February 3rd to the 7th. Well, scams aside, simply filing your taxes can be a struggle in itself. After the break, how a local program could help you file for free. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Deductions, withholdings, earned income credits. If tax terms make your head spin, you may be able to get some help. Once again, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program has set up shop all across town to help qualified people with low and moderate incomes. And as 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz explains, the price is right because it's free. Yes, ma'am. Your social and your ID? It's tax time at the Claude Black Community Center, where volunteers and laptops are fired up. I prefer somebody to do it. I don't trust myself <laughs> with the numbers and figures. So Jacqueline Coleman yeah. is using VITA, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. So is Kashonda Pellerin. Because it's free. Free for households that earned up to $55,000 last year. Organizers expect 30,000 people to show up. One reason, not everyone's computer savvy. The technology divide is a huge deal. VITA has 19 local sites where taxpayers can bring their W-2s and more. Is there something that people tend to forget to bring? Yes. People tend to forget their Social Security card. If you're getting a refund, of course you want it now. The fastest way to get your money is to file electronically and to choose direct deposit. The IRS says most people do get their money within three weeks. If that's not fast enough, there's something new, a refund anticipation loan. While such loans can often be considered predatory, United Way's Jason Aleman says these are not. That means that if I'm really in need of getting my return immediately, I can take out a refund anticipation loan with River City Federal Credit Union here at our Vita sites and ensure that I will not be charged anything more than $25. Volunteers will be on the job through April 15th. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. After a pretty pleasant day, it is starting to get chilly out there, so I like to think about these days as onion days. You dress in layers, right? From Good job. Okay. Yeah, that was good. That was a stretch. But that's okay. All right, outside right now, it is chilly outside. It's 50 degrees in San Antonio, 49 at Port S.A., 49 at Stinson, 43 up at Bernie Stager Field, and 43 in Bull Verde. We are going to warm up, though, quite significantly. We'll go from the 80s to the 30s in a span of 24 hours this week. An Arctic cold front on the way. I've got to look ahead and the potential for some light wintry precip too. We've got to talk about that. That forecast coming up. How about that onion weather? 
onion weather. I, it was I don't really think bad. it was a stretch at all. I think I've been up since 2 o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> She has worked a double shift, you guys. This is it's happy okay. to do so because yes. Katie Blake is having fun That's yeah. right. on vacation, which yeah. is really wonderful. And so is Adam Kasky. So. That's right. So but they're missing this the weather. They're missing the good weather. It was gorgeous out there today. It was beautiful today. A little cold to start, but very comfortable mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Temperatures were in the 70s and will continue with that trend in the 70s through Tuesday. It is February. Look, it looks like San Antonio is in the... There's a heart right. explosion. There's a heart explosion around Bear County. Uh, <laughs> here's the typical weather that we usually experience on an average day in February. The high temperature is usually around 67. Morning lows right around 44 degrees. And as far as rainfall get, goes, we get about maybe an inch and three quarters of rain. Uh, and that is actually pretty dry. In fact, February is the second driest month in San Antonio, right behind January by just a couple hundredths of an inch of rainfall. So although we usually don't get much rain in February, it would be nice to see some because we're experiencing severe drought in some places. Take a look at the time lapse. Beautiful sun uh, set with a little bit of cirrus clouds moving in play. And now we've got clear skies out there, mostly clear skies rather. 72 was the high, 39 was the low. A little warmer than average in the afternoon, a little cooler than average in the morning. And temperatures have already cooled down by 22 degrees since the afternoon high. It's 50 in San Antonio, 49 Port SA, 43 in a Bernie stage. And this morning there was a light freeze up in Kerrville. Could happen again uh, as we head into the early morning hours tomorrow morning. Just some cirrus clouds moving in place, but a wider view here. We've got a dome of high pressure kind of starting to settle over Texas. So what that means for tomorrow is that our weather is going to be great for Super Bowl Sunday. Waking up right near 42 again, some cirrus clouds, but look how quickly we warm up. As soon as the sun rises, we'll be off to the races with that heat getting up to near 70 right around lunch and 75 in the afternoon. Southwest wind at about five to 10 miles per hour. Perfect Perfect weather for barbecuing or throwing around the pigskin for Super Bowl Sunday. Then we'll see increasing cloud cover uh, and it should be overcast by the start of the week with uh, just a few light showers early Monday morning. But then we're going to get warm. Temperatures are going to get close to 80 degrees on Tuesday and it's it's really going to be noticeable. This cold front, this Arctic cold front that's going to move through is going to quickly drop temperatures from 80 on Tuesday to temperatures in the 30s and 40s on Wednesday with the wind chill potential in the 20s. So we do have a pretty strong Arctic front on the way. Wednesday is also going to be interesting because we will have some light rain in the forecast, but up in the hill country, there could be a light wintry mix as well. We'll keep an eye on this. It is a little bit too far off to really give you a down packed forecast at the moment, but I do just want to give you a heads up that Late Wednesday and early Thursday, there could be that light wintry precip. Although right now what it looks like is that if we do get that, there would be no effects on the roadways, so it should be nice. Then it's going to get chilly by Thursday morning. We'll be waking up near freezing. And again, that's when we we'll want to watch out for that potential for a light wintry mix. Other than that, we're not going to get any good, decent downpours over the next seven days. Again, just a small chance for isolated rain early on Monday. Warming up Tuesday, then behind that front, feeling more like winter. All January long, we did not have a freeze, which was the first time since the 1940s that wow. we didn't have a freeze in January. That's a long time. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I mean, I guess February. It was a warm January, but it looks like we'll get a freeze in February. The winter without winter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, the uh, Spurs were lying on the bench pretty heavily tonight. Yep, it was Jakob Pertl and Patty Mills, and they both heat, heated up, excuse me, as they came back in the second half to pick up a big win against the Hornets tonight. When we come back, we'll show you the highlights and hear from the locker room as they celebrate a big win in their final home game for, before the rodeo road trip. Plus, Roosevelt picks up another win in district, and they are still perfect on the season. Next. We competed in the second half. We didn't compete in the first half. Coach Pop, quick to the point in his assessment of the Spurs performance again tonight in Big Board Sports. The Spurs certainly flipped the script. Midway through the second quarter, San Antonio trailed the Hornets by 17 points. And it took a second half rally sparked by Jakob Pertl and Patty Mills. Pertl finished with 7 of 8 from the floor with 17 points, while Mills scored 11 off the bench. But most impressively, San Antonio held the Hornets to just 27 points in the second half. That's one point less than they had in the first quarter. The Spurs win 114-90. to 90. 
we really got it going on defense. We, we were aggressive. We started trapping the pick and rolls. We tried to make them uncomfortable. We started first forcing some turnovers, and, and that's really what, what turned the game around for us. Every single guy out there was trying to make a play. Um, whatever it was, whether it was steal, getting in the passing lane, block shot, rebound, anything. And, you know, we got a couple in a row. Um, they kind of got a little disoriented, and we just felt fed off that. All right, big win. Spurs now start their rodeo road trip in the Staples Center Monday night against the Clippers. Time for some high school hoops. District 27 6A action this afternoon at Littleton. Undefeated Roosevelt taking on Madison. Mavericks putting it to the Rough Riders early. Bryson Barnett spots up for three, and he's going to drain it. Mavericks go up 14-11 to in the first quarter. Second quarter now, Rough Riders trying to put a little distance between the two teams. Daquan Kindred. Hits the pull-up J right there, 19-17 Roosevelt. Then a few plays later, ball goes inside to Rashad Owens, and he kicks it back outside to Caleb Parker, and he knocks it down from distance. Roosevelt goes on to win, 62-51. Over at Paul Taylor Fieldhouse, Clark Girls hosting Brennan. They had some trouble with the ball pressure in the first quarter, but Madeline Gomez finds a winner there. Cougars ball here. Kayla Harris drives and gets a runner to fall. Cougars go up by two early on. And a few plays later, the defense steps up. Aaliyah Robinson comes up with a block. And then in transition, Haley Adams with a toe on the line, drills the long two, and Clark rolls to a big win, 66-33. to State births were on the line this afternoon at Josh Davis Natatorium for the Region 7 6A Championships. We start on the boys' side with a 200-yard freestyle. In a stacked field featuring three previous state qualifiers, it was Churchill Samuel Player taking, strong, taking charge with a strong back half to win in one minute, 38.65 seconds. That breaks the pool record set back in 2008. Player also won the 100-yard freestyle, earning him boys swimmer of the meet honors. And most importantly, the Chargers finished the top, the boys team standings. I was crazy. I couldn't believe it. Like, it's so hard to believe that of all the people who have swam in this pool, that that is the fastest. It's kind of mind-blowing to me. This is senior year. I was, we weren't expecting to get the win. We knew we were close, but after the relays, we weren't sure if we had it. We were, it means a lot. It's, it was so exciting. Meanwhile, on the girls' side, the day belonged to the Johnson Jaguars. Junior Samantha Robles earned one of Johnson's two individual titles on the day, scrapping her way to the wall to win the 100-yard butterfly in 56.79 seconds. She was also a key component in both the regional champion 200-yard medley and 200-yard freestyle relays as the Jaguars take home the girls' overall team title. I just felt uh, like all the pressure was on me. And then, like, towards the last 25, my cap started falling off. So I started worrying about that. But thankfully, I still made it. I'm so proud of my teammates. Like, we worked so hard for what we've done. We have a full recap of this meet right now on our website, ksat.com. You can go over there and check it out right now. And luckily, they've got all the tough stuff done, so tomorrow they can just relax and enjoy the big game. I really like that we give love to the kids in the pool. My daughter's a swimmer, much younger, yeah. but uh, <laughs> it's always great to see those kids get a little love on the TV, too. And hopefully she can get up there soon enough when she gets in high school. i got to coach her to swim faster. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Faster! <laughs> all right, thanks, guys. An unconventional solution to a persistent problem. Tell me something good is up next.